Um, we're going to look at a, a portion of Scripture and that we have started with in Hebrews 4, but we will be uh, looking further into it this morning. So if you've missed it uh, before, don't worry, because this will be uh, a completely different uh, message this morning. We'll not uh, need to go back to the other messages. Hebrews 4 and verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we have believed, we have believed, we which have believed, pardon me, and do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Father, will you take your own word and inscribe it on every heart this morning? Will you take your own word, Lord, and imprint it on every mind? But Lord, would you give us the faith to be able to take your word, to believe it, to trust it, to act upon it, and to do whatever you say to us this morning, Lord, to be whatever you tell us to be, to go wherever you tell us to go, to act however you tell us to act. Father, will you wing your word directly to our spirit this morning? And Lord, would you use this clay vessel, frailty, feeble, with many weaknesses and inabilities. But would you use me, Lord, and take me up in your spirit for your glory. Use my lips, Lord, and use my mouth. And may the word of God have free course in the midst of the house and in your people this morning. We ask it for your name's sake, Lord Jesus. Amen. Whenever we looked at this, the title we have given it is True Prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, not P-O-R-P-H-E-T. True Prophet, when the word is mixed with faith. And look, it's nice to have good things, nice things. It's nice to live comfortably. There's no one saying anything about that. And it doesn't mean to say because you may have worked hard at a business or you labor hard and you have nice things that there's anything wrong with that. So please let me put that out there. But true profit is when the word of God is mixed with faith. It'll profit you whenever we receive the word and with faith we believe the word and act on that word and live accordingly to that word. The word here for uh, prophet is found in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You know, how many times do we hear of the gospel, the word of God being preached to the unconverted? And yet they go away unsaved. We wonder, how can this be? Well, it's simply because they're dead and their trespasses and then their sins. Like you were and like I was at one point, one time. Like they are dead in trespasses and sins. And a dead man or a dead woman, if you go to their, their coffin or their casket and you speak to them, they don't answer you back. If you shine a light into their eyes, there's no optic nerve to open or close with the reflection of the light. They just can't take it. Sometimes we get to the place where we ask the Lord, why is no one being saved? Or when I preach, should I preach to everyone? The answer is yes, preach unto every creature and let God do his own work. But sometimes when people walk away, they hear the word, hear it with these ears. They get it maybe sometimes to some degree between their two ears. It's a, a mental ascent they get. They become religious with it, but it hasn't dropped as it were into their heart, into their spirit. And the only way a man and a woman can receive God's word, believe God's word, and live according to God's word is by the Holy Spirit. So it's quickening of the Holy Ghost, the quickening of the Spirit, being made alive unto God, being made alive unto his word. And you and I as believers 
who are believers in Christ, we were once dead and trespasses, trespasses and sins, but now we are quickened. We are, the word is zupoyo from uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we, you hath he made alive. He's quickened us. He reanimated us where Adam fell in the garden and he became dead spiritually toward God. Then death entered into his members, uh, that is his body, and he then would die, although live a long life, but he would eventually die. We find then that, that as, he, as time went on, he would die, but he was uh, aloof. He was dead toward God and God toward him. No way of being with God, reconciled to God. No way of even having communion with God and fellowshipping with God, even though God came in the Garden of Eden and walked with him in the cool of the day. And so when we took Adam's genes, we took Adam's germs, we took Adam's uh, original sin, and from Adam we have now been birthed from uh, the birthing canal, born and shaped in iniquity and in sin did our mothers conceive us. And we have no way of saving ourselves, not one way, as any person, no matter how good we are, any way of saving our own souls. The only way that a man and a woman can be saved is from hearing the word and the Holy Spirit quickening the word. Making, it, making the man and the woman who are dead in their trespasses and in their sins, making them alive unto God. In other words, the reanimation, of, I've explained this before in a simple term is, you know, animation, we think of cartoon characters. You know, the, the little animation, is a, it's a picture. It's a still picture. And then someone maybe makes, you know, that used to do the wee stick man, where you had the stick man and next thing, one arm came up, then one leg came up, and, and every page changed. But when you flicked them together, you seen him moving. He was animated. He went from a dead poise to an animated motion. He was alive. And that's what the Holy Spirit does to you and to me. That's what he has done to us. And that's the form he keeps us in, even though your flesh, my flesh, even though you and I want to go other ways. You know, your flesh and my flesh is no different than the flesh of the man and the woman who were out in the clubs last night and in their sin. Our flesh is no different. Paul said there was no good thing that dwelleth in him. He says, in me, that is in my flesh. No good thing. But the only thing he says in his flesh was because the Holy Ghost was in him. The Holy Spirit lived in him. And it's the animation, the reanimation unto God where the animated uh, character of Adam with uh, the garment of light, if you want, with that garment of, 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 eternal, of, of eternal blessing of the Lord, that he walking in the garden lost it when he sinned in the garden. You and I have inherited that loss, and so we can only be made and found in Christ for eternal life. And when we heard the gospel, the, the word brought true profit to us. P-R-O-F-I-T. The word of God by faith brought true profit. In other words, we were saved by the sovereign grace of God. Saved by grace through faith. And so because we have been reanimated, in other words, we are now alive under the things of God. Brothers and sisters, if you, uh, if you uh, say you, you, you love the Lord Jesus and you're born again of the Spirit and you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and if you're claiming that and you're saying that and yet you have no consciousness of God, well, then we have to look at that. You have to say, well, how far on am I in God and am I really alive in God and have I really been made alive and reanimated? Because every blood-washed, blood-bought, spirit-filled, born-again Christian will find themselves that, yes, our flesh wants to do things. Yes, our flesh wants its pound of flesh. Yes, our flesh would sin. Our flesh would take us down. Our flesh would drag us away from the things of God. Our flesh will tell us to be lazy. Our flesh will tell us you're too tired. Our flesh will tell us to go do this instead of going into your place of prayer, instead of Bible reading, instead of Bible study, instead of gospel service, instead of breaking of bread. Our flesh tells us to lie in bed and don't get up. Sure, you're just a little tired. Our flesh does all of that. And that is the death that it brings into you and I. That's the death uh, that reigns in our mortal members, that is in our flesh. And so it's up to you and I is, do we want true profit? P 
P-R-O-F-I-T. No. Do we want true profit? Do we want to reign in victory? Do we want to rule with Christ when he returns? Do we want to be overcomers in other words? Do we want place and part in the kingdom of God? Or do we want the, the courtesy of our own comforts? You know, whenever we think of these things, we say, well, you know, uh, the apostle here mentions rest. I want to look at rest for a few moments, and I want to show you that there is a rest, and many Christians don't enter into it. You know why? Because you're saved. You're blood washed. You're born again. You're, you're a Christian, that you, and you do love the Lord, but, you know, you don't pursue after him. You don't seek his face. You don't, you know, you don't keep the line of faithfulness when we're drawn by the Spirit and and the Holy Ghost is telling us to do one thing and we do another, to go here and we go there instead. So what we want to look at is there's a rest in God even for the Christian life. And there's true profit when the word is mixed with faith. In our reading here we find in verse 1, Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left any of us entering into his rest. What the apostle here or what the writer was saying here was there were those who heard the word of God they got it, as it were, in these ears, the shells at the side of our, our, the shells at the side of our head, with the hole in the middle. We got it there. He said, they got it there, but they didn't get it any further. They didn't get it any further, and so it wasn't mixed with faith. That is the Holy Spirit laying hold on you in the Word, and you through the Holy Spirit laying hold of the Word. He says, this is what happened, and so what happened was. Trial come and trouble come and, and heartache come and mourning comes and, and all sorts of things come in your life. And they fall away. So many people say to me, uh, I'm not so many, but quite a number over the years have said to me, you know, well, Pastor, you know, I feel of backslidden. I would say, and I say this in all honesty, I would say if everyone was honest, at some place, part and point of our lives, to some extent we backslide. In other words, we're cold in heart and we're, we're not what we should be. But backslidden meaning right away from God. We have no sense of him. We have no consciousness of him. And we're so far away, feeling as it were uh, in our own spirit that we are so far away from God. We have no notion of him. We don't want to come to church. We don't want to be at his house. We don't want to live right. We don't want to do right. We don't want to, we don't want to read. We don't want to pray. We find it hard and we're struggling. And it's in a sense, we're growing cold before God until we become completely, totally and fully backslidden in heart. And, and what I have said to some, and they don't like it, is this, is that, listen, when you're, Talking about backsliddenness, there's a meeting on down the road. There's a gospel service on on a Sunday night. There's a Bible study and a prayer meeting on where God's people meet together. Why are you not come? Because I'm backslidden. Well, then you're backslidden at home. You won't be backslidden if you're at your meeting. There's a place of Bible study. There's a place where you're not seeking after God. There's help in the house of God. There should be help and strength there. And, what, and if you're not coming to that, then your heart will fall away from God. That's where your strength is. When was the last time you put your luxuries away? We don't have many luxuries maybe between us all, but you know what I'm saying? The things that we want to do. When's the last time we turn our television off and read the word and seek the face of God? When's the last time you said, you know what, I'm not going out for a, a run this evening or I'm not going out in the car this evening or I'm not going to do that thing. I'm not going to do that thing this weekend. I'm going to seek the face of God. I'm going to be in the house of God. I'm not going to sit at home the, this Sunday night. I'm going to be in the place of God. And I'm not just saying for this Sunday night. I mean any time. And they, they wonder then why they backslide. They fill their lives full of newspapers and magazines that fill our heads full of nonsense. Bad news will always be the news that's propagated. Good news is never the news that's propagated. And so if you want to hear bad news, you can hear all of it. If you want to hear good news, you have to go sick in it. You've got to go looking for it. Because nobody wants to know good news. But the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. And if we sit 
uh, 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 whether it's at home or whether we go away or whatever we do, and we know, you know, we should be with God's people, then we will backslide. Our hearts will be cold. If we don't do what God's word tells us at that place, point, part, and time, when God speaks to us, say God has spoken to you right now. So what has he said? What has God pointed to you? And then we wrestle with it and we fight with it. See, and, and then it, it dies in us by the time we go home for tea. By the time we go home for our lunch, it's over, it's gone, it's not there. What does God's word say to you as you sit here in the, in the meeting even right now? What, what has God spoken already? Or here's another thing. What has the devil said? Ah, ah, bad news. The devil would love you to believe him rather than God. The devil would rather you believe him than God. So we must take the word that God has said. And we must take it by faith. And when we take it by faith, no matter what happens, we must look at it, we must receive it and believe it and keep it in the forefront of our mind, in our hearts, and we must walk according to it, even when we don't want to. So the devil says one thing this morning, and all you can hear is the devil and God saying, oh dear, here we are again. Notice this. The apostle says, or the writer says, you know, I, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, so that's why I keep saying the apostle or Paul, so you can forgive me. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left of us entering into rest. See, what happens is we lose out on our rest because we don't yield to God. Let me say it again. We lose out on our rest because we don't yield to God. We lose out on our rest because we don't yield to God. Whenever God has said, and he's maybe wrestled with you over a period of time. He's maybe spoken to you on numerous occasions and, and yet it's, you know it's him and in your spirit you know it's him, in your heart you know it's him and you know you must yield it to God and give it over, but yet we don't. And what happens is we don't have rest in our soul. Yet God wants you to have the fullness of rest. Notice this. He says here, any of you should seem to come short of it, short of the rest. Now I'm going to be honest with you. Let me, let me be honest with you. I got about an hour's sleep last night. Because there's so many things going around in my head, I couldn't switch them off. I had a rotten night last night. And everything's coming in and everything's attacking and certain people are before me and other things are happening. And the enemy's saying this and that and that. And I'm saying, Lord, I don't want to listen to what the devil has to say, Lord. And I'm lying with my face in the pillow, even at one point, talking to God, trying not to hear the devil, but trying to listen for the voice of God. Lord, I don't want to listen to this. Lord, I need to sleep and I'm exhausted, I'm tired. And do you know what? You can really hear the Lord saying, son, you're tired because you're not entering into that rest. I have a rest for you, but you're not entering into it. You're coming short of it. You know why? Because you don't trust me. Did you have brothers and sisters? We come short of his rest because one, we don't yield to it. Two, we don't trust him enough. We don't trust him enough to bring it to pass. We don't trust him enough that he will work it out. We don't trust him enough that at this moment in time, God is away ahead of us. He's already in the next minute. He's already in the next hour. In fact, he's in your this evening and in your tomorrow. And he's already getting plans in place, ready to put people in your way. Things will change. And all these things are happening. Yet we're walking, as it were, with very limited view, seeing through, as it were, a glass darkly. And we get afraid at times. We say, whoa, pull back the horses. We can't sleep with it because the devil's going, ah, you see, 
it'll amount to nothing. Ah, you see, it's gonna, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna be, you're gonna be thrown to the side, and nobody will want you. And all this sort of stuff is going on in your head, and never working. You'll never, you only feel, and all of these lies come to you. You're not a child of God. Have you really believed in Him? Are you really washed in the blood? What if you died tonight? Would you really be in God's glory? The devil speaks to you. Oh. We need to take the word, mix it with faith to receive true profit. True profit. And the word profit is the word otholeo. And listen to what it means here. It means to be bettered. To be bettered. So when we have the word of the Lord dropping into our spirit, into our heart, quickening us through the Holy Ghost and we get saved, we are bettered. It's true prophet. That's what it means. So in other words, no matter what the word affords, no matter what the word offers, no matter what the word has to give, what shall it Profit a man. It's the word athaleo. If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It's the word, what bettered is a man? What bettered is a woman? That they would be strengthened with the world's riches, with the world's pleasures, with the world's sin. And you know what we do in our mind? We already have that thing lined up, knowing that we shouldn't be doing it or we shouldn't be there or it shouldn't be happening or we shouldn't be talking about it or we shouldn't be saying or we shouldn't be going. And we know it, but sure, we're under grace and we're washed in the blood and sure, we're, we're all right. But there's no rest in it. There's no rest in it, brothers and sisters. You know where complete rest is? We're going to look at it now. Complete rest is found in a person. Believing him, trusting him, laying your all on him, laying your everything in him, investing everything that you are, investing everything that you have, investing everything that you ever hope to be or to become, investing your soul's security and your eternal welfare, investing it all in him, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true prophet when the word is mixed with faith. So what has God said to you? Has it been something you didn't want to hear? You don't like to hear? Join the club. <laughs> because when it's him, he will work all things out for the good. When it's him. Do you know the devil's a liar? Who knows the devil's a liar? Who knows that? For an assurance that the devil is a liar. Would you put your hand up again? If you know the devil is a liar, if you're assured in your heart 100% that he is a liar, he's the father of lies, and he was a murderer from the beginning, everybody in here realizes and accepts that the devil is a liar, then that means that God alone is the truth in Christ. Is that right? Amen. Then he is the truth, and it's his word entering your heart, mixed with faith, which brings true prophecy. And we need to stop listening to what he says. We need to stop listening to where he's leading. We need to stop listening to his calling. And we need to believe God for greater things. Now, I believe that God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God in many Christian circles today, in the year 2016 and for quite a few years, is under attack. The sovereignty of God means God is over all things. He is the creator. He is the maker. He is the keeper. He is the sustainer of all things, including you. He fills the heavens and the earth. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And yet he comes to live in our hearts. What a mystery. What a great mystery. Now, the sovereignty of God is under attack, but God says in his word, 
that he is sovereign. There's none like him. There's none beside him. So when we go to Hebrews 4, let's keep the sovereignty of God in mind and let's quickly just run through a few of these as we round this up. In verse 1, we have unrest. Let us therefore, lest a promise being left us of entering into his arrest, any of you should seem short of it. Unrest. So here we have this word. Here we have the Lord speaking to us. Here we have the Lord telling us. And no matter what the Lord says, no matter how much he says it, we wrestle with it and we just refuse it. Unrest. You'll never be at rest. Secondly, verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Notice the two groupings here. Those who are in rest, those who are not in rest. There were those who through trial were falling away from God. They were letting their profession of faith slip and go. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. It didn't better them. Not be a mix with faith in them. Notice in them. Not to them, but in them. It has to be in us. That heard it. So here we have no rest. It didn't profit them. There's no rest for them. Thirdly, we look at rest. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Now we're into uh, positionally the eternal rest of Christ because we are safe, saved and secured in Christ through his precious blood. Through his, uh, his dying, his doing, his dying and his resurrection. So we have entered into rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the word. So God from the foundation of the word already had a rest for you. Here's another couple of words that people don't like, but it's right through the scripture. Election and predestination. In other words, before there was a sinner in the earth, there was a savior in heaven. And before you were even a twinkle in your mommy and daddy's eye, the Lord knew you from before the foundation of the world. He loved you and he gave you to his son. That's how secure you are if you're in Christ. That's the rest that we have in Christ. And it's a wonderful rest. If we can get that, Lord, we're in you, but that will cause us to walk with him. Notice again here, so in verse three, there is rest which were finished from before the foundation of the world. And the, the, the idea of this is that Israel came to the promised land. All they had to do was cross Jordan. And they sent out, remember the spies they sent out, and they all came back with a bad report and an evil report. And only Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report. But the Lord sent them back into the wilderness again. Remember? And see, and he's, he's taken the picture of this. Here's your rest. It, God already had it from before Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees, before uh, Isaac and, and, and Jacob came along, God already had it ordained that Israel would move into the promised land, Canaan land, and yet they get so far through all these years, and now suddenly they've just the river to cross. But you know, we might have to walk a bit further. It's our possession, we can live in it, but there's giants, there's walls up to heaven. And so what happens is in our Christian life, there's giants and there's walls, up, cities walled with walls up to heaven. We, we, we can't be bothered. Would it not be easier to go back to the wilderness? They found out it wasn't. You know why? For the original ones who came out of Egypt died there. I don't want to die in faith, being away from God with no witness or testimony to leave him. I don't want to die in a backslidden condition. I don't want to die saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll hover around the wilderness of lethargy and laziness, and I'll hover around the wilderness of, of doing my own thing, and I'll believe God, but I don't really believe him. I trust him, but I don't really trust him enough, and sure, we'll see how things go. And they died in the wilderness. Look at verse 4. We have complete rest. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest 
the seventh day from all his works. God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And then in verse 5, we have God's rest. And in this place again, if they shall, if they shall enter into my rest, it's God's rest. And what verse 4 and verse 5 is saying, we have complete rest. It's God's rest in verse 5. And he's showing us it in verse 4. And what he's actually saying to those of us who are mixing the word with faith, which is true prophet, to better us in our Christian walk, in our, in our walk on this earth with him and at this scene of time with him, what he's saying is that God rested on the seventh day. In other words, on the seventh day, it's strange because when we were in the, the prayer meeting earlier, I had two ways to take this message. And I said, Lord, I don't know what way to take this message. I've had so much written down, but I don't know what way to take it. And, and Margaret doesn't know this, but she prayed this. Well, you probably do know you prayed that, but she didn't know what I was thinking. And she prayed this about this rest on the seventh day. And, and, and setting, the, setting the Lord's day apart. That, and I thought, Lord, thank you. You've just confirmed the way I have to go. And see, what God is saying is for the six days of creation, on the seventh day he rested, I mean, a complete, a total and full rest. Not that God was weak and needed rest, but really he's setting something down here. For seven days are in one week also. Seven is the number of God's uh, divine completeness. It's a perfect number. And so what he's saying is, look, in the sixth day, six is a number of man. On the sixth day, he says, you can, or six days you can labor, but on the seventh, he says, it's, it's the Lord's day. So the, 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 the creation of seven days and rest on the seventh, the week of seven days in a week, resting on the seventh. And listen, there's seven to the coming of Christ. A day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, Peter tells us. And when he says that, we're looking at from Adam until now, we have just arrived around 6,000 years. We have labored in the field of this world for 6,000 years as humanity, as a fallen humanity, but yet we're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that at his second coming, you and I who are redeemed and blood washed, we will be entering into the fullness of God's rest. You see that? But in this life we have rest if we trust him. The fullness of rest will come at his coming. And then look at the next one as in verse, let's just read down again. He limiteth a certain day saying, verse seven, pardon me, and David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now, brothers and sisters, we preach that. I used to do four openers a week. For quite a period of time I'd done it. And we used to go around different towns and just drive to one and go and preach morning, noon, or night. And often the scripture was, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And we, we mean that, and, and the Lord means that, that the unsaved should not harden their hearts, but really, they're dead. <laughs> so in other words, if God's speaking to you and it's quickening in you and it's pricking your heart and you realize, oh, hold on, there's something in this, uh, that, if I can call it the curiosity of the Holy Ghost, to the things of God is, and don't harden it. But he's speaking here to those who have the word mixed with faith and those who didn't. Those who have true profit and those who don't. And he's saying to you and he's saying to me, whatever God has said to you, if you've heard his voice this morning, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Notice this also. Verse 8, for if Jesus had given them rest. Now, the King James is the best English translation of the scriptures. We know that. I'm not going into that at the moment. We know that. But the word Jesus isn't speaking of the Lord Jesus there. That is actually, if I can call it an error, it is an error, but it isn't because it means the same. It's the word Joshua. Speaking of Joshua, the children of Israel, as I've spoken. So it means Joshua, Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew Joshua. So when it says here that if Jesus had given them rest, he's speaking of Joshua, bringing the children of Israel in and saying, here's a rest. He says, but there's even greater rest than Canaan land. Speaking of the kingdom of God to come. Speaking of God's heaven. 
So we have what is known as a promised rest. Notice, here's it here. For you would not afterwards have spoken of another day. In other words, we're in rest. Here's Canaan lands, what God's promised. But there's more. There's more. There's more for you and God, in other words. And what many tend to do is try, tend to, to skirt around the outside of Christ, as it were, to skirt around the, 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 you know, the, the milk feeding, the, the, the milk drinking of the word rather than the meat of the word. And they skirt around because it's, it's nice, it's candy floss, it's easy listening, and it's not too challenging. It, it doesn't convict, and, and, and it, doesn't really, it doesn't seem to make me want to have any anything to do with the, the word that, that's going to really cause me any upset. In other words, it's, it's one of those times when people would say, if you preach to me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. Teachers having itching ears, they're saying, my ears are itchy. Would you scratch them for me, preacher? Would you scratch them for me? And once a preacher starts scratching ears, tickling ears, once a preacher starts to do that, you know what happens? The word doesn't profit anymore. Not the true prophet. Not the true prophet. It's not, it doesn't better us for the kingdom. Listen, we're saved by grace through faith. Without a doubt, we don't dispute that. But listen, you're saved to serve. And see, because we're saved to serve, look at some of the parables, and I've taught you this before. Do you know there's going to be place and position in the kingdom of God? And the scriptures tell it. The Lord tells about the man with the talents and those with the coins. It talks about those being rulers over uh, five cities, being made rulers over ten cities, and so on. The Lord's giving us the idea that we are going to be having place and position in the kingdom of God, and yet, and yet in this life, we stress and we strain and we strive so much for the things of this life, the nicest house and the best car. And there's nothing wrong with that. But those things are temporal. Temporal. The responsibility of the word of God in our lives means that it challenges us, it convicts us, it compels us even into places that are uncomfortable. And when we think we have crossed that Jordan and made it, God says, good. You've done well, good and faithful servant, but there's more for you. God has more for you. Let's read them, running into a close. First hence says, for that he is entered into his rest. He also ceased from his own works as God did from his, let us there, labor therefore to enter into that rest. Now hold on a minute, does that, not, does that not seem strange? We're talking about rest, now we're talking about labor. Let us labor to enter in. Doesn't seem to go together, sure it doesn't. You see, the idea is people think rest is just, let's put the, the duvet over our heads and lay in bed all day. That's not what he means. It means being fully, totally, and completely secure in him where you can serve to your utmost, striving after the things of God, knowing that it's in your weakness, he is strong. He is strong. For let us labor therefore into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Do you know something? Your salvation is free and paid for in Christ. But you must work. You must be willing to yield for true profit to come to your life. I say this with respect. Look, I was saved in an altar call. I was saved in an altar call, so this is not any disrespect, but you see this every week, having an altar call and the same people coming to the altar to be received every week. That's a load of nonsense, brothers and sisters. That's nonsense. When you're saved, I mean, when you're saved, you're saved. You're saved.
So verse 11 gives us the offer of rest. Rest, unrest, no rest. Rest, complete rest, God's rest, promised rest. And that is your offer of rest. What's offered to us? God does not force his rest upon us. He offers it, his rest to us. And his rest can only be entered by faith, a diligent faith. Faith in what God's word says and his promises. And mixed with faith, it brings true profit. The word here for rest is the word kataposis, and it means to bring to a resting place. God's word, if you yield to it, will bring your heart to a resting place, no matter the storm. In fact, it gives the idea of that in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, and in verse 49, there's a storm, and, and it's the resting of the storm. It's the same word for rest here for you and I. So, Verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. Let me tell you just what that means. The word of God is quick. It means the word of God is alive. This isn't a dead word. If you take this word home with you and let it be in your heart and need to it, it's alive in you. It causes you to be alive. It's alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's the word energy is where we get our word energy. In other words, the energy in the word of God will keep you. The energy in the word of God will drive you. So it's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper. It means it's incisive. It's penetrating. Listen, and it lays bare all our self-delusions. Look, you can delude yourself. You can delude the preacher, the pastor. You can delude your friends. And you can be there, and you can believe your own lies in your own head if you want, but when God's word speaks to you, it lays aside all self-delusion that sits there. He says, here it is. What will you do with it? What will you do with it? What will you do with it? Yes, it lays aside, or it lays bare all self-delusions. It's piercing, it cuts through the body like a knife cuts through, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word discerner there, and I finish with this, is the word kritikos. And it's where we get our word to critique something. A critique. In other words, when you have someone giving a critique of a, a play, a book, a movie, or whatever it is, that's kritikos. That means they're judging what they think about it. They're judging what they see. And it means they have looked at it with a detailed look and given you their verdict. So the discerning power of the word of God looks in your life and looks into my life. It looks at our ways. It looks at our lifestyles. It looks at our hearts. It looks at our everything that we are and do, our thought life. It looks at our motives. It critiques, it takes apart and it analyzes, it's like putting out a, 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 like a plane, when a plane goes down, they take all the parts and they try to make up the plane. It analyzes it, that means it sifts it all out, and it looks at it bit by bit. And that's what the Word of God does to you. That's what the Word of God is to me. And whenever it does this, it judges us, and it sifts out and analyzes our life, then it says, this is the way. This is what you do. This is how to trust. This is whom to believe. This is how you're saved, and so on. And we can't get past that wall, because that will stand before us. If we're born of the Spirit, if we're quickened by the Holy Ghost. So true prophet, true prophet, when the word is mixed with faith, it gets better. And it's the same for healing, by the way. The Lord speaks a word to you for healing. You believe it, he'll heal you. It's the same. Whatever God speaks to you, whatever God says to you, he'll heal you. God bless his word to all of us.